But we're going to cover today the diagnostic exams that go along with um, your respiratory problems. Uh, there may be some that we that's in the book that I may not touch, but you're still responsible for those. Okay. I want to go over the most common uh, ones that you will see and the ones that people you know have the most often in the hospitals. First one is the pulmonary function test. Your pulmonary function tests are used to diagnose and monitor restrictive or obstructive lung disease. My son, every time he goes to the doctor because he has asthma, every time he goes, he has the pulmonary function test done. That's automatic. We know as soon as he walks in the door, that's what he's got to do. Now, in the hospital, it's a little bit more drawn out and complicated than what you see it being done in the doctor's office, but the purposes are the same. You're looking at the, the lung volume, the mechanics of how the lungs work, and the diffusion capabilities of the lungs. It basically determines that capacity of the lungs to exchange the oxygen and carbon dioxide. If you don't have that proper exchange, then you have problems. So that's what our basis of the pulmonary function tests are. Another very common one is, it'll be on Camtasia. <laughs> Another very common one is the pulse oximetry or the O2 saturation which measures that oxygen saturation within the bloodstream, within the arterioles in your fingers, or your earlobe, or your toes, wherever it is that they're monitoring that OT. And it basically works with the sensor that's attached, and it shoots a light beam uh, through, and the light beam is absorbed by the oxygen-saturated hemoglobin. If the hemoglobin is not there, then the light beam is not going to be absorbed and your number is going to be lower. So that is what your O2 sat is. It gives you a reading in percentage. Now look at this table just a second. Your O2 saturation, if you've got an O2 sat of 50, then your partial pressure of your oxygen is only 25. That's very life-threatening. A 50% O2 sat, life is not going to be sustainable unless we get that corrected. So the patient's going to ha be having severe respiratory uh, signs and symptoms. At 75, the partial pressure is only 40 millimeters of mercury. So once again, your patient is still, they're struggling. They're having problems. The O2 is not being absorbed into the bloodstream as it should be. So you have moderate hypoxemia. They will have signs and symptoms of dyspnea. Um, you'll have some paleness, maybe even some cyanosis of the tissues because that oxygen is just not getting there. Then with an O2 sat of 90, it's mild hypoxemia as well. We're not getting enough to the tissues. So what does our O2 sat need to be? It needs to be 95 or above. Okay, anything below 95, they're having some difficulty. For some patients, that may be their norm such as your COPD patients, as we talked about the other day. That may be their normal. It may not, they may not can tolerate a saturation higher because they'll stop breathing. Okay. Hypotension can cause the pulse ox to be low. Hypothermia 
When the fingertips are cold, the vessels are constricted and not allowing the oxygenated blood flow to get to the tips of the fingers. If you have a patient that that's the problem, warm up the fingers. If you can't get it on one hand, try it on another. Because it could be you've got decreased circulation in one arm versus the other arm. So try it on both sides. Warm them up if they need warming up. You should not put that sensor distal to your blood pressure cuffs. Because when that blood pressure cuff blows up, it's going to cut off that arterial circulation and your sensor is not going to read. So make sure when you're taking your pulse ox and your blood pressure at the same time, put the blood pressure cuff on one side, put the pulse ox on the other. Otherwise, you're going to look at it and go, oh my God, patient's got an O2 sat of 50. And it's all because the blood pressure cuff is cutting circulation off. Don't put it below pressure dressings. Don't put it on sides that have invasive catheters going into them, like the arterial lines. You're going to have some alterations. And it should not be taped to the finger. However, you will see that some of the ones, especially those that are used on pediatric clients, they will tape those to the finger, and it has a special type of tape attached to it that you wrap around it. But your Clip-on monitors that you see being used in the hospitals, those should never be taped. Because you might cause some constriction there to the vessels, which would cause a decrease in the O2 sap. <laughs> Dark fingernail polish should be removed because it may interfere with the accuracy. And note here, your blues, your blacks, greens, the brown reds, those are all potentially going to cause problems. Your red nail polish may be left, pink nail polish may be left. Uh, however, to prevent having any problems, most are in the general rule of thumb, you remove all nail polish. Okay, But like a pink or a light color, it might be okay to be left. Artificial nails, it says here, do not affect accuracy. That's one book that said it does not affect accuracy. Your book says it may need to be removed. Because, and if you think about it, it depends upon that artificial nail and what the color of it is. Whether or not the light beam can pass through the nail. If you've got long artificial nails that are touching the end of the sensor, then it may cause it to be off a little bit. So you may need to remove them. Best overall rule of thumb is go ahead and get whatever's in your way off. And that way it's going to be accurate. A patient that has hyperbilirubin, hyperbilirubin, may have a false reading because there's so much bilirubin in the bloodstream that it's affecting the results. Patients that have right-sided heart failure may be inaccurate since they have high levels of positive and expiratory pressure, which gives a, a pulsation in the venous system. When you've got high pressures like that, you'll have a a pulsatile sensation there in the venous system. And it may pick up that, which in the venous blood is going to be low oxygen. It could pick that up rather than your arterial blood flow. So be aware of that. Your ventilation perfusion lung scans these are most often used to identify pulmonary emboli. 
whether or not your patient has a pulmonary emboli. Now you see here you've got pulmonary infarctions, emphysema, fibrosis, and bronchiectasis are also uh, diseases that it can help to identify as well. But the one we most often think of is the PE. And with that, you have a radiopaque substance, a radioactive substance that is uh, given during that ventilation scan. And it helps to identify where ventilation is occurring. Then once you identify ventilation, then they give an IV radioactive substance that is carried to the pulmonary vasculature, carried to the pulmonary vessels. If you have a decreased blood flow to any part of the lungs, then it's going to identify that there is a blockage in that area. This helps us to identify the PEs. If the lung is well ventilated, which means that the air is getting in there and it's getting to where it should be, but has no blood supply, then you have a pulmonary embolism that is suspected to be there. The images are compared with those that were taken during the perfusion and any variance in what should be taking place, they suspect there is a problem, a pathological problem that is there. Does that make sense? Nope. <laughs> in, one, in the ventilation scan, that radioactive gas is showing where ventilation is occurring. The blood supply to the lungs. That's why it's called a ventilation and perfusion scan. Because you're looking to see if, if there's a problem with ventilation or is the problem with the perfusion. Yet you've got that gaseous exchange that occurs at the level of the alveoli and the capillaries. If you don't see that oxygenated blood supply in the lungs, then perfusion's not taking place. Something's blocking it. And what we're looking for in most cases is a PE, a pulmonary emboli. If y'all remember, I think I may have told you about the little guy that I had, 38 years old, was in the hospital, came in having problems with his legs, and then the problems, he began to have some lung issues, was scheduled the next day to go to LaGrange to have a VQ scan done, which is also a ventilation perfusion scan. Sometimes you'll hear it called VQ, sometimes you'll hear it called VP, but it's the same thing. He was scheduled to go to LaGrange the next morning to have this scan done to identify whether or not he was having any pulmonary emboli. When he threw bilateral pulmonary emboli that night about midnight and did not survive. So that is what this is for. They think, did they think you had a blood clot that was? Are you going to take them up on what they said? <laughs> Might be too late. <laughs> better quit now. If you've already got a problem, well, they did you better quit now. Uh, with a lesion can be a tumor as well. Well, they saw first I had uh, lung cancer.
Stop. Get rid of them. And, and it can be done. My mother dipped snuff for 70 something years. Quit cold turkey. About six years ago. Hadn't picked it back up. It can be done. Now don't wait till it turns into cancer. Stop it before it does. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's why you go ahead and quit. So that. You can take Chantix. <laughs> you can do the Nicoderm patch. <laughs> Y'all help her. That's probably the point of it, though, is to keep you from smoking. Well, y'all just help her. When you see her out there, tell her to put it out and go back inside. <laughs> so I guess you better just stop. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Pre procedure care. You're going to need to explain what's going to take place to the patient. They can remain dressed, but they have to remove all metal objects. It is a form of x-ray. It is a nuclear medicine, so that's why you've got to remove everything. It is painless, um, except for the local discomfort from the IV injection. They will hear clicking sounds because your x-rays are being taken, your pictures are being taken while throughout the process. If they become dyspneic during the procedure, then you can have them sit up because that may help. Uh, radiation exposure is minimal and the procedure itself takes anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes and it depends upon the patient. Uh, your elderly patients are probably going to take a little bit longer because it's going to be harder for them to, to do all the breathing. Um, and they may have trouble lying down during the procedure. Mm -hmm. All of your dyes, and that's a good point, uh, all of your dyes that are injected during these procedures is going to give you a very warm flush feeling and it when it hits the vessels in the bladder or around the bladder it does make you feel as if you are voiding on yourself you're not but it will give you that sensation it is very weird and it's gone though it happens and that sensation is gone but at the time that it's occurring you're going to think you're wetting all over yourself your chest x-rays these are your normal part of the routine normal screening uh, that will be done on anybody that comes in with lung issues 
it does show the bony structures um, surrounding the lungs. They are used when pulmonary disease is suspected. They're used to monitor respiratory disorders and abnormalities. If a patient has had TB, then they're not going to have a TB skin test anymore. They're always going to have a chest x-ray because they're always going to be positive for the TB skin test. So you go ahead and do the chest x-ray and you can tell on the chest x-ray if the patient, um, if the TB is still encapsulated or not. Chest x-rays are done to confirm ET tube placement, that's endotracheal tube placement, or tracheal tube placement, which is the TT, or NG tube placement, such as with tube feedings. You will always see a chest x-ray done after you have a traumatic chest injury, such as in a car accident or blunt chest trauma from being hit by something, and that will help to identify whether you have fractured ribs, whether you potentially could have a punctured lung. Um, so it will, they're used quite often. <laughs> Pre-procedure, you need to let your patient know that it is painless. All they have to do is go in, stand in front of the x-ray machine, and it takes the pictures. There's minimal, minimal exposure to the radiation. However, they do need to know whether or not you have the chance of being pregnant. If you are within that age of being pregnant, then they will do a pregnancy test on you before they will do the x-ray. That is standard procedure. Okay. Um, I took my, at the time she was probably 13 years old. She went down here to the Wadley Clinic to have, she was having some congestion issues and and I think maybe even, may have even been for scoliosis, I don't remember. But she had to have the chest x-ray done. They asked her, is there any chance that she could be pregnant? And she told them no. Well, they still had to get a urine sample to do a pregnancy test. And you talk about a 13-year-old being just blown out of the water. She was embarrassed. She didn't understand why they had to do that, why she had to go pee in a cup to have that done and it took a lot of explaining to her and encouraging her you know, it's just simply got to be done it's a routine there nobody's saying that you're lying nobody's she was very embarrassed about it so be careful with that age group you know because it is embarrassing to them and very difficult for them to understand. Well, I done told you I hadn't been exposed in any way to be pregnant. Why can't you just believe me? So just make sure that, that you're very careful with that. They do have to remove all jewelry and underclothes and put a gown on. Um, occasionally, you'll be able to get away with a bra that has only plastic clasps and things on like the the ones that fasten in the front it'll have they'll have a little plastic closure on it rather than a metal and occasionally you'll be able to let the patient leave that on it just depends upon who the x-ray tech is um, shield the gonads during during the procedure so your patients will have they'll wear the little skirt um, the lead skirt around the waist so that it does protect in case you know they want to have children later because that can damage the gonads during the procedures. Uh, it only takes five ten minutes. It's not not a long procedure. Depends upon how well the patient cooperates. You know if they cooperate real well they're out in five. If they don't then they're out in ten. You know 
especially with your little children because they don't understand how I got to be still when I'm standing here. Mhm. Mhm. You know, you just got to be still. The fluoroscope and your book doesn't really mention the fluoroscope um, per se, but your fluoroscopes are used a lot of times to do um, guided procedures, uh, such as a needle biopsy. They'll either do a CT guided needle biopsy or they'll do a, a fluoroscope guided needle biopsy. And basically it lets you observe those structures while they are functioning. I mean, you can see the lungs the breathing in and out. Uh, so it does help when doing procedures like a thoracentesis or a lung biopsy. It helps to be able to see exactly where you're going uh, during the movement of those lungs. It is a live action camera. These are other uses of the fluoroscope. Helps you to observe that diaphragm during inspiration and expiration. Allows uh, medial style movement for you to, to detect medial style movement during deep breathing so that if there's a tumor or something there that may be pressing on that medial stinal, you can identify it uh, with the use of the fluoroscope. Assessing the heart, blood vessels, and related structures. It helps to identify esophageal abnormalities and detects the medial stinal masses. It is painless, the procedure itself. Now, of course, if they're using it for a needle-guided biopsy, then that's going to be something totally different because you're going to have local anesthetic used. You're going to feel pressure of that needle going in. Um, but the actual fluoroscope procedure itself is painless. They use fluoroscope in, for cardiac procedures. So, uh, it is a painless procedure. Sometimes you will see that they will use the radiopaque, radiopaque contrast material, um, such as with your cardiovascular test. Uh, they may insert the radiopaque material or dye into the femoral artery, and it's going to go through up into the heart. You can do the same things with the lung structures. So you may see that being used. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're asking your patients, are they allergic to anything? Now this is a non-iodine based material. However, there are some cases where they may use an iodine based material and you want to know are they allergic to shellfish? Are they allergic to betadine? Yeah. But you have to make sure that they're not allergic to anything before they use this material. They do have to wear a gown, just as with any other x-ray, no jewelry. It takes about 30 to 45 minutes for the procedure to be done. Your exposure to the radiation is minimal. You do want to make sure they are not pregnant. The bronchoscopy. Who's Whitney? Tell them about the bronchoscopy, Whitney. They can biopsy, they can obtain secretions, they can take just pictures. 
because it is a camera that they use and it's put up on the screen. Used to, and the ones in the rooms, they'll still occasionally do a bronchoscopy in the room and you're actually having to look down through the tube itself um, to see what's going on. But the ones in, that's done in the department is put up on the camera where everybody in there can see the structures, not just the doctors looking at them. So it's pretty neat. Okay, so here's your basic definition. It's a lighted bronchoscope into the bronchial tree. <clears throat> she actually got to see the corona, where it bifurcates and go. Did they go down into both lungs? Everything branches off of itself <laughs> until you get to the alveoli, and then that's that cluster of what looks like a cluster of grapes. Um, most of what I have seen is your flexible fiber optic instrument so that it bends and curves. It's a little easier on the patient than the just the rigid steel. Of course, when they first came out, everything was rigid. You know, but we have made long jumps in our care. The purpose of the, the scope is to examine the tissue. Uh, you may already know that there's a tumor there and you're just needing to monitor it to see if it's growing. Um, you get tissue samples. You evaluate any of the areas for bleeding. You can remove foreign bodies. I had a patient um, several years ago that went into the ER uh, because he had swallowed a chicken bone. Uh, not a chicken bone, it was a pork chop bone. And it had lodged in his trait. So they had to use the bronchoscope to go down and retrieve the piece of bone that he had aspirated. So that can be done. You can remove thick viscous secretions. What does viscous mean? Thick. They're slow moving. They're very thick. You can treat postoperative atelectasis. You can destroy and remove lesions. So you, they can actually do cauterization with the bronchoscope of an area, um, remove any lesions that they identify while they're in there. Atelectasis is where you have collapsing of the alveoli. And post-operative collapsing is very common. But if you remember from last semester, I told y'all that if your patient develops a fever within 24 hours after surgery, then chances are it's because they they're have atelectasis. And if you teach them to do the deep breathing exercises, then it will clear itself up. Fever will go down. This is when you've got post-operative atelectasis that the deep breathing is not working. And so they actually go in and they can inflate those alveoli uh, during that procedure. Don't see that being done very often. Was your patient, Whitney, was he MPO or she MPO? I can't remember if it was male or female. They are typically MPO for six to eight hours. Because you don't want to get in there and stimulate that gag reflex when you're going down and then them uh, throw up and then aspirate that emesis. That's not a good situation. So they are MPO for six to eight hours. Most of the time they use a solution 
a numbing solution to spray the back of the throat so that you don't have the gag reflex. Uh, need to teach your patient prior to the procedure that the throat will be sore afterwards. I mean, they're putting this big tube down in the back of their throat. It's going through the nose and going down the back of the throat. They're going to irritate it. So they need to be aware of that. They may have some difficulty swallowing afterwards. They may even have some blood-tinged sputum. And that's normal. They don't need to panic over that because of the irritation that was caused to the throat. Um, you do need to remove their dentures and contact lenses and any other prosthetic device prior to the anesthesia. They will give both a local, which is the spray that they spray in the back of the throat to numb it, as well as IV sedation. And they will help to suppress that cough reflex and cause that patient to be more relaxed and cooperative during the procedure. Now, because they're using conscious sedation, they are not completely out. Okay. They won't remember anything because they're using the versed that causes the amnesia. But they will be able to cooperate. Did you see that? They don't. They don't. Most of the time. I've had conscious sedation a couple of times, and I remember bits and pieces, but not the entire procedure. So I don't remember it being painful. I remember them talking to me and telling me to do things, but I don't remember feeling anything. So that's a good thing. Now, they will have a gown. They will have to wear a gown just like with any other procedure. It does take about 30 to 45 minutes. They also need to be aware that their head is going to be hyperflexed. And so if they do have any neck discomforts or anything, that may be increased after the procedure is done because of the hyperflexion of the neck. Um, the local anesthetic is administered only to the oil airway, and it's usually like a spray-type solution. There's one called hurricane spray that they use to numb the back of the throat. Um, you will need to monitor your vital signs. You want vital signs before they go for the procedure, and you will need to be reassuring to that patient throughout the procedure if you are in there with them and the vital signs will be monitored throughout the procedure. This is what the scope looks like. See how he is going down into that main stem bronchi on the right side. He'll back it up a little bit and go down the main stem on the left side as well. And like she said, once you start in to that area, everything looks the same because you've got branches off, off everywhere. Post-procedure, you need to monitor vital signs according to your policy. Most of the time, your policy is going to be every 15 minutes. It's going to be either times two or times four. It will depend upon your facility. And then every 30 minutes times two, and then every hour for the first four hours, and then they go every four hours for 24 hours after that. Just to make sure that there's not any major changes in the vital signs. You want to make sure you're observing for respiratory distress. They should not have any trouble breathing after they come out. Um, so you want to watch for any use of accessory muscles. Listen to those lung sounds to note any changes in the lung sounds. If they become absent, if they begin to wheeze, whatever the case may be. Inspect the expectorated secretions for hemoptysis. What is hemoptysis? Blood in the sputum. 
and they will be NPO until that cough reflex or gag reflex returns. Uh, and it depends upon what kind of numbing agent was used, but most of the time it's going to be approximately one to two hours before they will have that gag reflex return. Once it returns, and of course you all know from last semester, you know how to check that gag reflex. Okay. Using that tone blade, get you a cotton tip swab is the best way to do it, and put it back toward the back of the throat. Um, you start with small ice chips and then small sips of water to gradually build them up to make sure that they're not going to aspirate. You do also want to watch for laryngeal edema. If the patient's having laryngeal edema, what are you going to hear? Strider. You're going to hear strider. You're going to hear that seal barking sound when they're trying to breathe in. Edema, because it's narrowing that airway. Swelling's occurring, and so the airway's becoming more and more narrow. I don't have it. Um, Tanya has one. She's still here. Uh huh. She's upstairs. I've not received mine yet. <laughs> Be sure to notify the doctor if there is any hemoptysis, especially if it's a large amount. Now, blood tinge is not something to be alarmed over. But if it is large amounts of blood that they're spitting up, then that is something to be alarmed about because something could have been perforated. You also want to watch for asymmetrical chest movement, which would indicate that a lung has been punctured. Any questions so far? Can I maybe a little bathroom break? A finger break? Just listen to me, because you're, all, you're gonna get writing. it eventually. I just stopped writing. I'm gonna listen to you and sit and write, so I'll go back and write later. And on what you're, you're gonna get it. Saying. I'm not gonna completely withhold it from you. <laughs> yeah, Most of it's in the book in some way, shape, form, or fashion. It's very little. It's not as in depth. No, that's why I have additional notes. <laughs> it's because it's not as in depth. If the bronchial tube is set on the uh, x ray, like it's right here, this is supposed to be the size of a finger, mine's the size of a thumb. How bad is that? Mm, you could have some issues later due to smoking. No. On Saturday, on the twenty fourth. Um, and we'll just have to see what they that's what Brad was asking me if I had if I was coming Friday. I'm thinking we may have to go to Oklahoma Friday, but I really need to be in that meeting. So. All right, let's get back going where we can get finished with this information. Pulmonary angiography. This is basically like your, we typically think of a cardiac cath, but instead of it being a cardiac cath, the dye is going into the lungs. It's still, it, the pictures are being taken of the lungs. Um, it does detect your abnormalities of that pul pulmonary ven venous circulation. 
It helps to identify any diseases. It looks at the destructive effects of emphysema on the lungs. So it helps to identify how far damaged or how much damage the emphysema has done. Uh, it does look at peripheral pulmonary lesions and those are the lesions that are on the lungs that are on the outside edges of the lungs. The extent of the thromboembolism. The potential benefits of resection from a patient that has had a carcinoma of the lung. Resection of the lung as to whether or not you can remove just the area where the lesion is located or how much benefit is that going to be to the patient is what it's looking at. As I said, it's the same procedure as you would have the cardiac angiography. You have the catheter that's placed into peripherally or directly into that main pulmonary artery. Um, most of the time it is done peripherally and it's usually inserted in the femoral artery and goes up through um, to the heart and to the lungs. Patients should be MPO for four to eight hours. prior to the procedure. You do want to question about allergies to x-ray dyes, so you would want to question your patient about shellfish, iodine. Explain to them once again that they may experience that warm feeling when the medication is being injected. And they may feel as if they're going to wet themselves. You must have a consent form signed, and it is an informed consent. The patient needs to understand what the procedure is all about, what risks they're taking having the procedures, what the benefits are, and then what other alternatives to this procedure could be done. Post-procedure, the patient is going to lie flat for three to eight hours. It will depend upon what type of sealant that the hospital uses. Some of the hospitals are using sealants that is injected into the area where the catheter was inserted. They're using sealants that they may be able to get the patient up in an hour to two hours. But, you know, for testing purposes approximately three to eight hours. And they're lying flat like this to prevent bleeding. Yes, three to eight hours, depending upon what type of sealant they use. You want to monitor that site because bleeding can occur. Um, I will never forget having a student with a patient that had come back from a heart cath procedure. They had held pressure. Seems like we went to lunch and when we came back, the care assistant had gotten the patient up to go to the bathroom. And as soon as we walked into the room, the patient was bleeding profusely. Um, it's very difficult to get one under control when that happens. So you're standing there, you're applying pressure for, sometimes it seems like forever, but you want to make sure that you're applying pressure to stop that bleed. The patient never should have got up. Although it was right at their time frame, they were oozing a little bit and should not have been gotten up. So you have to watch it very carefully. Uh, occasionally you'll see a sandbag being used on the floor, uh, usually a three to five pound sandbag that's used to apply pressure, when you, particularly when you've got somebody that's bleeding like that. Okay. Um, occasionally you'll have, you know, like a pound sandbag that's automatically put on the patient when they come back. 
you know, it just depends upon the facility. A sandbag. You put it over the incision site to apply pressure. That kind of keeps a nurse from having to stand there for so long applying pressure. So you want to also encourage fluid intake so that you can promote excretion of that contrast dye that's been used. Um, we need to get that out of the body. So you want to encourage them to drink plenty of fluids to excrete that dye. Sputum collection. Do you remember what we said about sputum collection last semester? You have to do it first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning. It comes from deep in the lungs. It does, it's not just you're spitting the saliva out of your mouth, but it needs to be deep in the lungs. So you're going to assess your patient. <laughs> A lot of times your patients will already be coughing up sputum, uh, so you want to look at the color, the quantity. Is there any blood in the sputum? Is there any food particles in their sputum? A lot of times there will be. That should not be happening. Food should not be going down into the lungs. So we have a big problem if they're coughing up secretions deep in the lung that has food particles in it. Um, it should be collected before any antimicrobial treatment is started. So when you get a patient on the floor and it's, the doctor says um, sputum culture or sputum for CNAS, and then they've also got the antibiotics that's going to be given to the patient, the pain meds and respiratory treatments, everything is listed that sputum collection has to be done first before any of those antibiotics can be given. Otherwise, you totally screw up the results if you give the antibiotics and then get the sputum specimen. So it may be they come onto the floor and they're not coughing up anything right now. It may be a couple of hours before you can actually get that sputum. So you just need to notify your doctor that you know they're not coughing up anything right now. It's going to be a little bit uh, do you want me to go ahead and give the antibiotics or do you want me to continue to wait? And he's probably going to say continue to wait until you get that uh, sputum culture done. Uh, you can have um, your sputum collection may be for TB, which is usually an acid fast uh, smear that is collected. If you are doing a collection to detect TB, that AFB smear will be done three times. It'll be AFB times three. And it'll be done for three days in a row. <coughs> Excuse me. Acid fast bacilla. And that's the type of bacterium that your tuberculosis bacterium is. Yes. They are uh, it's sent back to the lab in usually a brown looking uh, cardboard type can. That is correct. Once a, day. Once a day for three days and it's done first thing in the morning. When the sputum is more plentiful and concentrated, you want to get enough of that bacterium to be sent. for three days. For three days. The AFB test for TB. And that is sent to the state lab. That is not done at the labs within the hospital. It is sent out to the state lab. There are two different types of methods you can use to collect sputum. You can collect it by direct method. You want to make sure your client brushes their teeth before they give you the sputum sample. 
because you want to prevent contamination from the bacteria that has grown in the mouth overnight. So you go ahead and get, have them get up and brush their teeth. Then they need to cough, a deep cough, from using that diaphragm, a nice big deep cough so that they cough up from deep within the lungs. Place it in the container. And then if, if you've seen the sputum containers, you know, it has one area, it's got two tops on it. One top, the patient opens up, coughs and spits their sputum down into the, to the um, little cylinder that's in it. And they put, there is a top then, you close that top, then at the bottom of the specimen collection device, you open that up, slide your cylinder out, there is a top for the cylinder down at the bottom. So you get that out, keeping the inside of that cap as sterile as possible. Then when you pull the cylinder out, you put that top that was at the bottom, put it on the cylinder, label it, and send it to the lab. The whole purpose of it is to keep you from coming in contact with the sputum. Okay? You would wear just clean gloves because you're touching parts that are not sterile. But you keep that cap as sterile as possible. And you said this is a test between right? This is any sputum collection. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, that's the acid fast, which was at the very beginning, okay. is your your test for T B. Okay. I was wondering why you put a mask on. <laughs> you would uh, if they suspect T B you would have a mask on. That's but this is with any sputum collection. Okay. Good question there, though. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Inhalation of nebulized saline or water can be induced into the patient to help to loosen up some of that sputum to cause it to be coughed up more easily. So if they can't cough it up, do you, do you do the percussion on the you could, sure you could, to still try to get it the direct method. Mm -hmm. The indirect method is where you have a sterile suction catheter with an attached suction trap. It is a lot of times referred to as a loogie tube. <laughs> yeah. And the loogie tube is just it's a trap that's placed on a regular tight suction catheter, but instead of when you suction that out, instead of it going into the canister on the wall, that loogie tube traps it in that tube so that it can be taken and sent to the lab for testing. Um, <coughs> you also have a cricothyroid puncture that can be used, which I'm sorry, but I've, I've never seen that done and don't think that that is the best option to do because you want to maintain the sterility of the system. And so if you are puncturing, then that increases the risk of infection for that patient. So that's not something that I would want to see done. But basically they're, what it's talking about is they puncture the trach, suction out uh, or aspirate out some of the sputum. Not something I'd want to have done. And just listen to this. Don't try to write anything down. Um, a student called, this is something that I found in a paper. It says, a student called me several years ago when a new MD from California had ordered a patient to be snoggled. What is snoggle? It is typically performed with, with non-compliant patients who cannot or will not cough. The practitioner will use either a 4x4 four four gauze or a hemostat and hold the patient's tongue forward while stimulating the cough reflex with a catheter. In other words, they hold the tongue out while the patient is suctioned. This is not expressively legal treatment and I may not, and I may recommend you have the physician perform the procedure if they want it done. 
This is a form of patient abuse. Another term is slosh and bag. When the secretions become thickened and the patient cannot expel them, small amounts of saline are inserted through an endotracheal tube and the patient is then uh, ambu bagged prior to the suctioning. They use the ambu to breathe for the patient prior to the suctioning. And that's called the slosh and bag. So those are just a couple of other terms that you may hear at some point in time, but it would not be something that I would recommend. Your cultures, the obtained specimen is examined for the ordered culture and sometimes sensitivity. And most of the time they do order a CNS. The culture itself is identifying the bacteria that is causing the problem. A sensitivity is identifying what medications would eradicate the bacterium. Okay, so that's what your culture and sensitivity is. A lot of times you will see that they will do a, 20, a gram stain to identify the classification of the bacteria and then they will do a culture as well. A lot of times that gram stain just identifies the class so that you can go ahead and get them on an antibiotic that would potentially eradicate it. But then it takes 24 to 48 hours before you get any sort of results from your culture and sensitivity. So that just kind of speeds up the process. If they do a gram stain first, then that lets the doctor know, okay, you know, I've got gram positive cotsi. These are the medications that I know would treat gram positive cotsi, so I'm going to use one of them. And then the, when it cultures out and they do the culture and sensitivity, they may get more specific about the, the specific medication that would be used. So they may have to change the medication but it does help give them a closer uh, medication. Okay, a thoracentesis. This is on page 608 in your book. Your thoracentesis is performed to drain fluid or air from the pleural space. It removes any accumulated pleural fluid or air that has caused the lung compression and respiratory distress. In other words, lung compression, it may have caused atelectasis. The lung may have collapsed because of the pressure of the fluid or the air within that pleural space, causing pressure on the lungs so that the alveoli cannot expand as they should. And so it collapses. This is a picture of a pleural effusion. Pleural effusion is the fluid that has collected. You see here this pink area is the fluid. The lighter pink area, the larger area, is the lung. You see that? See how that fluid has collected there? <coughs> Mm -hmm. I used to have a pen that I can... This area here is the lung. It's not, yeah, there it goes. This area is the lung. It's not writing real well, but... And this area here is the fluid. Huh? Pre-procedure for a thoracentesis, you want to be sure that a chest x-ray has been done prior to a thoracentesis being done and identified the area where the fluid is located. You must have a consent form signed. Otherwise, you cannot do it. Okay, the patient has to know all the potential complications, the risks, the benefits, 
everything has to be explained. You will position the patient sitting on the edge of the bed with their feet supported and their arms and head on a pad on the overbed table. So you put a pillow on the overbed table so that the patient can lean over on it. Uh, that is the best way for the patient to be. One, it helps to stabilize the patient. Two, it helps for that fluid to go to the lowermost part of the lung so that the doctor knows more about where the fluid should be located because gravity mm -hmm. takes the fluid down. Okay. They may also straddle the, a chair with their arms resting on the back of the chair. That helps them be in that leaning position. If they are unable to sit up, then you can have them lie in the bed on the unaffected side. So if I've got a, a pleural effusion on the right lung, I'm going to have the patient lay on the left side. Elevate the head of the bed at a 30 to 45 degree angle, which again, gravity helps make sure that fluid goes down to the bottom of the lung. And then raise their arm above their head in a recumbent position with the arm resting under the heads. So it's going to be like this just like you would lie on your side. Okay. <clears throat> and that gets them a little bit more in a sitting position even though they're lying down. The gravity helps pull that fluid to the base. This is an example you note here your patient is sitting on the edge of the bed, <clears throat> leaning forward on the table. It is a painful procedure, so the patient needs to understand that it is painful and that they do not need to jump, because if they jump, you can puncture the lung, uh, you can puncture vessels. You know, there are lots of complications that can occur. The needle is, is or is not actually the needle is going into the pool space surrounding the lung. Okay. The patient must remain still so that the needle doesn't go in further than what it should. You can position yourself in front of the patient to help to hold them and to encourage them to be still. Uh, you may have to hand things to the doctor. If so, make sure that you're maintaining the sterility of what you're handing to them because this is going in the lung. We don't want to contaminate anything. <clears throat> it takes about 5 to 15 minutes to complete the procedure. If we are drawing out large amounts of fluid, then it's you see this um, little tube here that is connected to a container so that as he aspirates that fluid out that fluid's going into a container usually you know at least a liter uh, size container i have seen them get one to two liters out of that area it is a sterile procedure everything has to be set up in a sterile manner you may be responsible for setting up the sterile field and for maintaining the sterile field. Okay, so just make sure that everything does remain sterile. Mm -hmm. It is painful. And your patient, well, your doctor, if this is the first time you've assisted with this type of procedure, be honest with him. Tell him you've not assisted with it. Don't go in there and try to flub dub your way through it and make him think you've done it before. Because if you're doing that, you're going to screw up. So tell him up front, because he's going to be a whole lot less angry with you if you screw up, if you've told him this is the first time you've assisted with this procedure, than if you go in there making him think you've done 15 of them, and then him, you screw up and he finds out you've never done it before. So be honest with him. Make sure that he understands. 
I went in with a patient in LaGrange when I first hadn't been out of school very long at all. The pulmonologist that was doing the procedure was one of the most feared pulmonologists over there. I told him up front when I walked in with him to help him with this procedure that I'd never done it before and that I was scared. He said, oh, come on, we're going to do fine. He walked me through every step of the way. But if I had gone in there and told, made him think I'd done it before, he'd have been on me like a bobcat. Yeah, so make sure to be honest with your doctors. During the procedure, observe your patient for uh, dyspnea or any complaints of difficulty breathing, nausea, pain. Monitor their vital signs and assist the doctor as needed. Usually, yes. We will give them something for pain, but this is not a conscious sedation procedure. So they will have something for pain, but you know, they're going to be totally awake throughout the procedure because they've got to cooperate very well. Sometimes they will numb the area with a little lidocaine. It just depends upon the doctor and how quick he needs to do it. <coughs> Post-procedure, turn the patient to the unaffected side. Never saw that before in my life. That says an outgoing call cannot be made since the application is dispatching an input synchronous call. I have no idea what that means. Anyway, turn the patient to the unaffected side for an hour to help to facilitate lung expansion. If you put that patient down on that affected side, then it's not going to be able to expand the lung. So you put them on their unaffected side with the lung that you just did thoracentesis on up. Okay? Watch for tachypnea, dyspnea, any changes in color such as cyanosis. Watch for retractions. Listen to those lung sounds so that you can identify if, excuse me, if you have if your patient has developed a pneumothorax. So make sure you're watching for that. So that air doesn't get into the lung and cause a pneumothorax. And a lot of times, your doctor's the one that's going to do that. And it's it'll be what's called Vaseline gauze. He will apply that over the puncture site so that no air can get into the lung. Hmm? He does it as soon as he pulls that needle out. Yeah, it is simple, but he does it as soon as he pulls the needle out. Because, one, he wants to make sure that that's done. Uh, vital signs also are going to be like every 15 times 2, and then every 30 times 2, and then every 4 for the first 24 hours. I think I skipped one somehow. No. <clears throat> you do want to record the amount of fluid that was withdrawn. An x-ray will be done after the procedure to make sure that if, if the lung is reinflating as it should. I don't know what this is doing. Uh, monitor for any development of subcutaneous emphysema. And subcutaneous emphysema is when the skin feels like bubble wrap 
when you press on it. It will pop and snap just like bubble wrap will. Um, subcutaneous emphysema. It's where air has leaked out underneath the skin. It goes into the pleural cavity and then into up into the skin. It doesn't usually cause a problem unless it is uh, increasing in amounts and it may constrict uh, the trach if it's increasingly abundant. It could cause constriction of the trach. Okay, a lung biopsy. You may have what's called an open lung biopsy, which is performed by surgical exposure of the lung. Can be done with or without endoscopic uh, exam using a needle that is designed to get core lung tissue. Or it can be done by a needle biopsy, which is done under that fluoroscope, as we mentioned. Um, the lesion is identified on the chest film, and then they'll use a topical anesthetic agent um, over the area where the biopsy is going to be, and they will insert a needle into the lung tissue and into the identified lesion and pull out a sample of tissue and fluid from the lesion. You want to watch for complications, hemoptysis, of course, blood in the sputum, a hemothorax where blood collects in that pleural space, a pneumothorax where air collects in that pleural space. Both your blood and your air will cause that lung to collapse. So you want to make sure you are watching very closely for signs and symptoms of that. And of course, the patient will suddenly have difficulty breathing. You may not know if it's air or blood at that point, but you know they're having trouble breathing. You're going to have diminished lung sounds on that one side, and you're going to notify the physician. And they're probably going to come and put a chest tube in, whether it's blood or air, it's not going to make a difference. They're going to put a chest tube in to get it out. Post-procedure, you watching that speed them very closely and observing for any uh, distress, monitoring vital signs, breath sounds, skin color, temperature, watching very closely. A laryngoscopic exam. Okay. Did you hear from? Yes, but she wouldn't go to the doctor. She went to the She took her home, but she took her home. We'd have just kept her in the lab if we'd known she wasn't going to go to the... Mm. Be careful. Okay, your laryngoscope is used to identify any laryngeal cancer, and it's done by direct visualization of the larynx, um, where you're looking using the laryngoscope to open up the back of the throat down to the vocal cords and you're actually looking to see if there are any lesions there. Um, the indirect method, you can do that by looking at um, using a small mirror to look down into the vocal cords. Uh, 
course, I think if it were me, if I'm trying to decide whether or not I have laryngeal cancer, I'd much rather just go direct method. Let's just see what's there. And most of the time, that's what they are using. The instrument should not touch the tongue or the patient will gag. Um, the nasopharynx should be inspected for any drainage or bleeding or ulcerations or masses uh, that would identify a problem inserting the scope. Direct vis visualization is performed using that lighted endoscope. Um, you can do it either by nasopharynx or you can go through the oropharynx down to visualize. Um, if it's going through the oral pharynx, I think that's a greater risk of contamination because you've got all the germs in the mouth and the tongue moving. You've got they have to hold the tongue still and insert the scope and go down. So it's a little bit easier to go nasopharynx, even though it may be a little more uncomfortable, um, but it is easier for the patient to see or for the doctor to see. They're instructed to breathe in and breathe out rapidly in a painting type um, situation. This decreases <clears throat> that gag reflex. While they're quiet, they look at the tongue and the epiglottis and the vocal cords. They have them do that E and AH to help to identify any problems with the vocal cords. They look for lesions, they look for changes in coloration, they look for swelling um, of the vocal cords or the area surrounding the vocal cords. A lot of times patients are identified to have what is called LPR by looking at the vocal cords. And that's laryngeal pharyngeal reflux. So they don't just have GERD where you have gastroesophageal reflux but the acid is refluxing up into the larynx as well, uh, causing problems with the, laryn with the larynx itself. They'll be hoarse. They'll, they may have some, a lot of coughing going on because all that irritation uh, is being done. If the patient cannot cooperate, then they insert it through the nose. Well, if you go to an ENT office and they do this, they do it in the office with the lighted scope and they do it nasopharyngeal, which is over pretty quickly. It doesn't take them long to do it. My husband had this done last year, year before, because he does have LPR. You do too? Because he he's always making himself throw up because he's doing stupid gross stuff. And so like he, he has like really loud like hoarseness. Damaging the vocal cords. Every episode he makes himself throw up like twenty dozen times. So I mean for every they do it in the nursing home. They do it with um, the swallow studies, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they use the the same type of scope and everything to identify problems with swallow studies. Mm -hmm. Right. So. It's pretty interesting. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word, <laughs> but you're looking at the mediastinum through an incision into the suprasternum which uses an endoscope uh, as well. Now, suprasternum, this is your sternum. It's going to be above the sternum, so you're going to have an incision into uh, the suprasternum going down into the mediastinum to identify if there's any lesions or abnormalities there. Got 
Okay. Okay, your arterial blood gases. This is to obtain arterial blood for ABGs. Typically done at the radial artery. They will palpate the pulse, clean it real well, and puncture that radial artery to withdraw blood. Now this is where on that question on the test it said something about if it was spurting, <coughs> you're going to pull out whole pressure. You hit an artery. Okay. In this case, we want them to hit the artery because that's what they're doing. They're getting the arterial blood gases. So you will have to hold pressure once this has been done, usually about 10 minutes to make sure that that artery has stopped bleeding. Otherwise, it's going to continue to spurt out while ev with every beat of the heart. So you want to make sure that you are holding pressure to not to stop that bleeding. It is sent to the lab on ice immediately, or they now have these wonderful little tubes that has something cold in it, and they just stick it down in there, and it goes to the lab. And but in the olden days of nursing, we put it on ice and sent it to the lab. Babies are very difficult to do because they're squirming and their arteries are so tiny. It's very difficult. If you're doing it in the radial artery, which is the most common place, now you do have the brachial artery that can be used as well, as well as the femoral artery. But the most common is the radial. You want to have the patient to perform the Allen test. Y'all remember talking about the Allen test and assessment? Hmm? It's right there. Patient's hand is formed into a fist while the examiner compresses the ulnar artery. Compression continues while the fist is open. If blood perfusion through the radial artery is intact, the hand should flush. If it is not, then it will continue to be pale. The site is then prepped, usually with alcohol, and allowed to dry. So, everybody make a fist. Use your, ulnar, use your thumb to occlude your ulnar artery. And then open your hand. Your hand should turn immediately pink. Let's you know your radial artery is intact, that you've got good blood flow there. Because you've occluded one of the arteries that feeds the hand. Your ulnar is opposite the thumb. Your hand's pretty pale. <laughs> Look at the change in color. When you, when you had your hand, your fist clenched, and you pressed your ulnar artery, and when you open it up, did you have a change in the color? A little bit, but not much. You may have some poor circulation in that radial artery. But that's how you determine whether or not that radial artery can be used for um, testing. Both of her vessels. It's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the way to test it. Post procedure for the ABG, as I said, you know, it may take a good 10 minutes. Specifically for the femoral, they say hold 10 minutes. You may can hold five for the radial, but you know, be on the safe side. Hold it a good 10 for both of them, and that way, you know, hopefully you won't have any complications. If it continues to bleed, then we need to notify the physician. 
course, if they're on blood thinners, you need to hold it for longer because they're going to be at a greater risk of bleeding. They may have a hematoma to develop there, which can cause problems. So you want just hold it so that it doesn't cause any complications. Any questions? Those are all of our lab tests. I think you're probably pretty well overwhelmed. We will come in on Tuesday of next week and we will lecture that entire time because we will cover the upper respiratory system and we will start on the lower respiratory system. Upper is not that much. I mean, it's not that complicated, but the lower respiratory system is. So, 8 o'clock. It's been 8 o'clock every Tuesday. But you know, last question is like, I will try to get it up sometime today. I told y'all not to do that. I told you the first day not to print. Yeah, but this was the day the class was supposed to be, so... If you looked at them, they're the same as what you had already printed. They had not changed. Well, this is the first time I looked at them, yeah. <laughs>